Hello and welcome. I am a physicalist, which means I believe that everything in existence, including my own apparently subjective experience of the world, is a physical system evolving in accordance with some set of laws or principles. Further, I believe that all of the phenomena we experience in our everyday lives are, at least on the fundamental level, perfectly well explained by the laws of physics as we currently understand them. Personally, I prefer the word physicalism over materialism because the correct description of physical reality might not end up involving anything like our naive conception of material. Quantum physics already poses significant challenges to our intuition about what is physically real. But by any name, this position on reality is controversial. It's incompatible with libertarian free will, denies the existence of souls and other supernatural phenomena, and in particular contradicts most religious beliefs. Still, with the ever-growing popularity of atheism and skepticism, especially in places like YouTube, there seems to be no shortage of people identifying as materialists. In fact, the echo chamber of my leftist YouTube recommendations is so hegemonically anti-supernatural that I barely even feel the need to offer justification for my physicalist beliefs. Instead, I'll just link to some essays and talks by physicist Sean Carroll in the video description. Dr. Carroll's work is relevant to this video not only because he provides arguments in favor of physicalism, but also because he articulates very clearly his belief that there is no afterlife. In his speech at the Freedom from Religion Foundation's 2014 National Convention, he says, When you die, there's no way for the information that was you to persist after death. There is no way for that stuff, that knowledge, that set of beliefs and feelings that made you you to leave your body. This sort of position seems to be pretty popular among atheists and skeptics. Since you are merely a collection of atoms in some complex configuration, there is simply no way for you to continue on once your brain stops functioning. In other words, death is final. We are utterly powerless to avoid the perfect eternal nothingness of our eventual demise. And in the words of the great existentialist tradition, fuck. Although you'll hear some people claiming that the finality of death makes life more meaningful because the stakes are higher, that doesn't feel like much of a consolation for those who grew up genuinely expecting to go to heaven. But of course, just because a conclusion sparks deep existential dread doesn't mean that it's false, and so for a long time this is basically what I believed. My goal in this video is to explain why I don't believe it anymore. I'll be defending the following three positions. 1. Sean Carroll's argument against the existence of an afterlife relies on a tacit assumption about human identity which contradicts physicalism. 2. The existence of an afterlife is entirely consistent with the laws of physics as we currently understand them. And 3. The existence of an afterlife is likely and is a scientific question. Let's begin with a series of thought experiments. As a quick disclaimer, while I haven't seen anyone present this exact sequence of thought experiments, I have seen most of the individual steps in the work of philosophers who are much better informed on this topic than I am. First, imagine sitting in a room staring at a clock. Suppose that the room is equipped with a device capable of halting and subsequently restarting all the physical processes occurring throughout your entire body, including your brain, harmlessly freezing you in place while time progresses normally around you. From your perspective, what would it be like if such a machine were turned on for a few minutes and then turned off? Naively, one might expect to feel themselves frozen in time while the device is running, but this expectation stems from a misunderstanding of the relationship between the brain and subjective experience. Your perception of time passing is the result of physical activity in the brain, and because the device temporarily halts all such activity, you would have no conscious experience whatsoever while the device is in operation. From your perspective, it would be like teleporting in time. One moment the clock reads 9.20pm, and the next it reads 9.23, with no apparent discontinuity between them. I should preemptively note that there are some possible objections to this assertion. If you believe that being you depends on some kind of temporal continuity of experience, you might be tempted to say that the person who gets frozen at 9.20 isn't actually the same person as the one being unfrozen at 9.23. From this perspective, the original person's consciousness is irretrievably extinguished by the freezing process, and the person who starts existing at 923 is entirely new, despite being physically identical to the original. The problem with this perspective is that it contradicts the physicalist assumptions that we started with. If the person in 923 has the same exact physical structure as the person in 920, then they are the same person in every relevant sense, only translated a bit in time. Remember, under physicalism there is nothing beyond the physical. The original person doesn't have any soul, irreducible consciousness, or intrinsic essence that could be lost in the freezing process. We'll return to this style of objection later, but for now let's continue with the experiments. From now on, I'll be referring to this first device as a time machine. 
Imagine that the room is equipped with a second device, capable of manipulating the position of each and every atom in your body while the time machine is active. We perform the same experiment as before, except this time as soon as the time machine activates, the new device moves every atom of your body a bit closer to the clock. From your perspective, you find yourself instantaneously shifted not just in time, but also in location. There is no magical loss of identity. The person at 923 is, for all practical purposes, the same as the original. At this point, hopefully it's clear that the specific path each atom in your body takes to reach its destination is irrelevant. All that matters is that by 923, when the time machine unfreezes you, you've been perfectly reconstructed at your new location. In fact, since all that really matters under physicalism is the pattern in which your atoms are arranged, it doesn't even matter if the second device uses the same atoms that made up the original body to construct the new one. Now, if we just expand the range of our two machines so that they can function outside of the room, we've arrived at a version of the classic teleporter experiment. The machine picks apart your physical structure, atom by atom, and then reconstructs you at your destination. Your experience using the teleporter would be just the same as before. One moment you're standing in a room looking at a clock, and the next you find yourself at your destination without any sense of time having passed. But now let's return to the objection I mentioned earlier. Many people feel very strongly that the reconstructed person would not really be them, that their original consciousness would somehow fail to transfer over to the new body. The reality, under physicalism at least, is that once the new body has the same physical structure as the original did, there is absolutely nothing left to transfer over. No inner essence, no soul. In fact, one can even imagine this kind of teleportation transporting you faster than the speed of light, albeit completely accidentally. For the machine to reconstruct you at your destination, it needs information about your physical configuration, and that information can't travel any faster than the speed of light. However, there's nothing, aside from sheer improbability, preventing your physical structure from suddenly arising in some distant part of the universe by random chance. From your perspective, the scenario shouldn't be any different from the previous one. Now that our experiment is being performed on a relativistic scale, it's worth taking some time to think about how sensitive it is to the relative timing of events. Up until now, we've assumed that the original body is destroyed before the new one is constructed. I'll leave it as an exercise for the listener to show that this will be true independent of reference frame, as long as we assume that the teleporter transports information slower than light and that it must destroy the original body before it can transmit its information. However, if teleportation occurs at faster than the speed of light, as in our previous example, things get a bit more complicated. There will exist a reference frame in which the destruction of the original body and the miraculous creation of the new body occur simultaneously, but there will also be reference frames in which these two events occur in either order. And because there is no preferred reference frame, we have little choice but to conclude that the precise order in which these events occur will make no difference to the person undergoing teleportation. While this is a somewhat technical argument, its implications are tremendously counterintuitive. We saw in our first experiment that teleportation can be used to travel forwards in time, merely by reconstructing a person's body in the future. But what we have now is a situation in which a person effectively travels backwards in time. Just as before, from their perspective, the jump feels seamless. One moment they're in a room with a clock, and the next they're in the past. Moving on, let's modify the original experiment again by supposing that the teleporter doesn't need to destroy the original body during teleportation, and also that it can create more than one copy of the original. I claim that because both the original body and each copy have the exact same physical structure, they are all equally real continuations of the original person's subjective experience, regardless of the order in which they come into existence. Suppose that the teleporter is in a room with red walls and is set to produce nine copies of the original, all of which will appear in a nearby room with blue walls. Imagine yourself in the position of the original person waiting in the red room to be teleported. If you believe that spatial or temporal continuity is necessary for your conscious experience to be preserved, then you'll expect to remain in the red room with 100% probability. Another common perspective is that you have a 10% probability of remaining in the red room and a 90% probability of suddenly finding yourself in the blue room. This is what we would expect to happen if, out of the 10 physically identical copies of your body, one is selected randomly and uniformly to be the continuation of the original subjective experience. This perspective, when interpreted carefully, has an element of truth. If all 10 people were blindfolded and, after teleportation, asked to report the probability that they are in the blue room, the correct answer would indeed be 90%. However, this probability is only meaningful after teleportation has occurred. 
If one of the bodies were to be the unique, true continuation of your subjective experience, then there would need to be something that physically sets it apart from the other nine. But by assumption, the bodies are physically identical, and so none of the bodies have any such distinguishing feature. If I were in the room waiting to be teleported, I would expect for one version of me to remain in the red room, and for nine additional versions of me to find themselves in the blue room. I could talk about the proportion of my future selves that will be in either room, but because none of them is being selected, no probability is involved. Under physicalism, I think that this perspective is the only defensible one, no matter how counterintuitive it might be to imagine 10 equally valid conscious continuations of one's own subjective experience. Before we can start using these experiments to talk about the afterlife, we'll need to make one more modification. Instead of constructing perfect copies of the original person, imagine that the teleporter starts making errors. Because a person's conscious experience is a result of what's happening in their brain, copying errors in other parts of the body won't be of any concern for our purposes. The teleported person's experience would still be a continuation of the originals, even if they're just a brain in a vat. So let's restrict our attention to mistakes made in the reconstructed person's brain. If only a single neuron is missing from the new brain, it seems reasonable to think that the person's original identity will be almost perfectly intact. On the other hand, it's clear that if too much of the brain structure is removed and replaced with new structures, the reconstructed person won't be a continuation of the original in any meaningful sense. We tend to think of the persistence of our subjective experience as being all or nothing, but what we have here is a continuous progression from survival of the original person, in the case where no errors are made, to death in the case where the brain is fully replaced. Any dividing line we might try to draw between survival and death in this scenario is ultimately arbitrary. What if the teleported person has all your memories but a significantly altered personality? What if they have your exact personality but a different set of memories? What if they have your same memories and personality, but don't feel as though they're the same person as the original? As a brief aside, some of these states of altered identity are entirely possible to experience in real life under the influence of certain drugs. My point here is that the teleporter doesn't need to work perfectly for its reconstructions to be continuations of the original person's subjective experience, and there's no objective standard we can use to determine which aspects of the original person are essential. Personally, I'd be willing to consider the teleported person to be a continuation of myself, even if they were missing most of my memories, as long as my basic beliefs, desires, and personality were maintained. Now I'm finally ready to start addressing my three points. First, I claim that Sean Carroll's argument against the existence of an afterlife relies on a tacit assumption about human identity which contradicts physicalism. As a reminder, the argument I'm responding to goes as follows. When you die, there's no way for the information that was you to persist after death. There is no way for that stuff, that knowledge, that set of beliefs and feelings that made you you to leave your body. These statements are true, but they don't imply that the afterlife doesn't exist. If, after I die, a physical structure sufficiently similar to that of my brain were to arise somewhere in the universe, that being's existence would be an afterlife for me in every relevant sense. This scenario is effectively the same as that of the imperfect teleporter. If you accept my conclusion about the thought experiment, then you must also believe that this kind of afterlife is physically possible. This alone establishes my first two claims. Just as in the thought experiments, the mistake is thinking that human identity depends on spatial or temporal continuity, which is a completely arbitrary restriction from the physicalist perspective. Of course, just because this materialist afterlife wouldn't contradict any laws of physics doesn't mean that it's actually likely to exist. However, the existence or non-existence of such an afterlife is a scientific question, at least once you've made your arbitrary decision about which properties a future being would need to have to be a continuation of your subjective experience. Perhaps the best chance we have of such an afterlife existing is for one or more of the various multiverse models to be correct. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which by the way happens to be the one that Dr. Carroll prefers, would immediately guarantee the existence of afterlives of every imaginable variety, as long as you believe that a person in a different branch of the wave function can be your continuation. If you agree with me on the thought experiment about accidental faster than light teleportation, then you've already accepted that your afterlife could occur in a part of the universe that's unable to causally interact with the part containing the original you. So I don't think that this is too much of a stretch. After all, my understanding of the many worlds interpretation is that all branches of the wave function are physically real. The one that we happen to occupy is no more or less real than any of the others. Another possibility is for the universe to be spatially or temporally infinite in such a way that our physical structures will almost surely exist again somewhere. 
For example, one cosmological model introduced by Sir Roger Penrose, called cyclic conformal cosmology, posits that the universe we exist in now is merely one in a sequence of universes, infinite in both the past and the future. Each universe, or epoch as he calls them, begins with a Big Bang and ends with a heat death, and the epochs are pieced together using some complicated mathematical tricks that I don't understand. From a lay perspective, this might seem like an unfalsifiable model, but my understanding is that it actually does make some experimental predictions that have yet to be sufficiently tested about gravitational waves and patterns in the cosmic microwave background radiation. To be clear, I am not a physicist or a cosmologist, so you shouldn't just take my word for any of what I just said. I would never claim to know with certainty that a materialist afterlife exists, but at the same time, I no longer feel that it's reasonable to expect eternal nothingness after death like I used to. People who believe in an afterlife are sometimes accused of wishful thinking. Of course, if someone doesn't want to stop existing, then they might exhibit some favoritism towards beliefs that reassure them they'll never truly die. Personally, I've never found much solace in the idea of life after death. When I was a Christian, I tended to think a lot more about hell than heaven, and after deconverting, I mostly looked forward to permanent non-existence, at least until very recently. In any case, a materialist afterlife of the sort I've argued for here can't offer the kind of consolation that religious ones often do. Just because an entity with physical structure similar to that of your brain happens to exist somewhere in the universe, doesn't mean that its existence will be long, pleasant, or even comprehensible. If Boltzmann brains are a thing, then we might expect the overwhelming majority of our afterlives to be short and meaningless, even by earthly standards. I don't believe that my interest in this topic stems from some deep psychological need to deny the reality of death. On the contrary, I like talking about survival after death because I think it reveals something interesting about how we think about the persistence of identity throughout our ordinary lives. We tend to think of ourselves as being in some fundamental way the same conscious subject as we were in the past, despite not necessarily sharing the same beliefs, memories, or even personalities as our past selves. Because the changes are gradual and fairly continuous, there's no specific moment we could point to where the past self is lost and replaced by a new one. But if spatio-temporal continuity doesn't make any difference for survival after death, then what reason do we have to value it so highly in this life? And since questions about self-interest are inextricably linked to questions of identity, our beliefs about persistence over time have practical consequences. We generally take it for granted that a person's self-interest includes their own future states, but not the future states of others. However, if we use physical similarity rather than continuity to judge what counts as a future state, it's no longer so obvious that the person who your current body happens to grow into is really who you ought to think of as your continuation. We saw in the thought experiments from earlier that survival of identity is not all or nothing, and that it's possible for multiple future beings to be partial or complete conscious continuations of an original. Depending on which aspects of identity a person chooses to value, their self-interest might end up encompassing some significant proportion of future human and even non-human life. After all, some of the most fundamental and important aspects of any person's identity, like their capacity to perceive themselves, to experience desires, to suffer, and to love, are common to all humans and many other animals as well. And I'm not just saying that you ought to care about other beings because their experiences are similar to yours, rather I'm arguing that their future conscious states are genuinely your own, to whatever extent they share your mental characteristics. Under physicalism, this kind of generalized self-interest is about as close to objective morality as I think you can get, and this sort of argument is how I personally justify caring about the well-being of others. However, since this style of thinking is extremely counterintuitive, it can be difficult to properly internalize, at least without some help from psychedelics. Accepting that our futures as conscious beings are deeply entwined in this way requires that we acknowledge the suffering of others as partially our own, Jesus-style, and that's kind of a scary thought. And yet the alternative, to be merely oneself, one vulnerable, isolated fragment of consciousness on the brink of eternal nothingness, is in my opinion a lot scarier. Thanks for watching.